Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SA Accounting Academy. Uh, here's a short clip on one of our previous webinars. I hope that you really do enjoy it. Good day, everyone, and welcome to this learning activity hosted by the SA Accounting Academy. Today's topic is IFRS 3 Business Combinations, and my name is Anton van Wijk, and I will be presenting this session. So welcome again. Some more background about myself, the presenter, if you uh, are interested to read. And then on the menu for today, just a short agenda for quite an involved standard, but I think it's important that we have an introduction to IFRS 3. What is the standard about? What is it that we need to be on the lookout for? Then I want to explain to you the purchase or acquisition method, same thing. Uh, that is the, the method that is prescribed by IFRS 3 when applying the accounting treatment for business combinations, and that's the only acceptable method uh, to use for business combinations. Then I quickly just want to look at deferred tax considerations, and I say there in brief, the reason being that that in itself can be a discussion of an hour long. So I want to try and stick to the time limit of the, the, uh, the learning activity of more or less two hours. So I want to just have a look at what the consideration points are that you should keep in mind when doing a business combination, especially at the acquisition date. And then lastly, I want to end off the learning activity with a quick comparison of IFRS 3, and that will obviously be full IFRS to section 29 of the IFRS for SMEs, so that we can just see uh, what the core differences are, because remember, many accountants deal with full IFRS and IFRS for SMEs, so you need to know what the differences are so that you can just apply it correctly. You cannot select or be selective in respect of which principles you want to apply from full IFRS or the IFRS for SMEs. Okay. All right, so introduction to IFRS 3, let's start off the topic. Uh, the important aspects that we find in IFRS 3 will firstly be how to identify possible business combination transactions. We need to know what a business combination transaction looks like, um, you know, before it will satisfy the definition of a business combination. So, that means that we would have to understand the types of business combination transactions before we understand how to identify them. Then once we've identified our, our business combination transaction that qualifies for IFRS 3 to be applied, we need to determine the acquisition date because the magic of IFRS 3 happens at the acquisition date. And that's why it's so important to correctly determine the acquisition date. Then we're going to be measuring the cost price, and that means that we'll have to look at the consideration that is paid or payable at the acquisition date. And it is very important that we carefully consider what the cost price is, the consideration that actually applies to the business combination, because there could be components that are hidden in the consideration that actually do not relate directly to the business combination and if they are then you know incorrectly left included in the cost price of the business combination they will obviously have an impact on goodwill or what we used to call negative goodwill which is now called gain from a bargain purchase so obviously if you get your cost price you know incorrect then your goodwill figure is also going to be incorrect so it's important that we measure the cost price appropriately at the acquisition date then we need to identify recognize and measure assets and liabilities at the acquisition date now ladies and gentlemen this is actually the part where ifrs 3 can get creative sometimes i find this part very interesting because if I look at all of the steps in IFRS 3, this is probably the one that one would have to look at the most carefully and the most intensively so that you can make sure that your net asset value at the acquisition date is fairly stated, is complete and consists of all possible identifiable assets and liabilities at that particular day. So there's a lot of guidance in IFRS 3 that we need to get through in respect of this point number four. But, you know, with, with a cost price, if you look at point number three, you have an agreement that stipulates more or less what the cost price actually consists of. Because 
the acquirer and the acquiree have agreed on what this particular consideration will be. So, yes, one still has to be, you know, cognizant of applying the substance of that agreement over the you know the legal form so so that you can account for the economic substance of the consideration but at least you've got some form of an agreement that guides you through that process so i would say that step 3 is is a bit easier than step number 4 step number 4 and your success in this point number 4 here your success there will determine how well you have calculated goodwill or gain from a bargain purchase and how closely that then represents the true goodwill or gain from a bargain purchase. Because every possible asset or liability that you overlook in point number four um, will obviously have an impact on the calculation of goodwill or gain from a bargain purchase. So step number four, very, very important. Step number five, Recognition and measurement of non-controlling interest. Now, remember, that will obviously only be when you acquire an equity interest. That means an investment in the shares of another entity. And it's not a wholly owned subsidiary, but you do obtain control. But, for example, you acquire a 60% interest and there's a 40% non-controlling interest that you have to measure and recognize at the acquisition date uh, in a business combination. Then step number six, how do we then ultimately recognize and measure our goodwill or gain from a bargain purchase? That does not stand for Great Britain Pound or something like that. Um, it is GBP, gain from a bargain purchase. That is the old negative goodwill. And that just basically means that you know the amount that I paid, let's say 5 million rand for the business combination, compared to the fairly stated net asset value that I'm acquiring, let's say 6 million, obviously there's a difference. I underpaid instead of overpaid. So when I overpay, there's goodwill. You remember the days when we spoke about positive goodwill and negative goodwill. So now we speak about goodwill being an overpayment and gain from a bargain purchase, which is an underpayment. And it is important that we distinguish between the two because obviously Obviously, they are treated very differently. The one is capitalized in the balance sheet, that's goodwill, and the other one is recognized in profit and loss at the date of acquisition. So we'll get to that point and just discuss what you should consider before especially recognizing gain from a bargain purchase in profit and loss. And then lastly, the period succeeding the business combination. So what do we do after the acquisition date? IFRS 3 is a standard that focuses intensely on the acquisition date, but it also provides some guidance as to what to do after the acquisition date. The reason for that is that if you look at step number four, there are certain assets and liabilities that are recognized uniquely in a business combination. And I'll give you one example. Contingent liabilities are always disclosed in the notes to the financial statements in terms of IS 37, if it is appropriate to disclose them, okay? If you decide that the possibility of the contingent liability uh, occurring is remote, then you do nothing. But we've never, in terms of IS 37, recognized contingent liabilities in the balance sheet. So now, in terms of step number four in front of us, we get the opportunity to recognize contingent liabilities at the acquisition date as a liability in the balance sheet. So we'll talk about that, but seeing that that is now happening, obviously IS 37 is not going to give you guidance on how to subsequently recognize and measure contingent liabilities because IS 37 does not uh, allow you to recognize contingent liabilities. So. In the same way, we have contingent assets, for example, indemnification assets that we can recognize at, you know, in terms of step number four at the acquisition date. And once again, we need guidance. I hope that you enjoyed that video. For more of our webinar videos, go to www.accountingacademy.co.za. Thank you and have a lovely day.